My name is Randy Hitz. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. This event is part of a series that we do every year, uh, once a quarter, actually. We sponsor a lecture by one of our faculty members in the School of Education. And why do we do that? We do that because we have a lot of great uh, scholars in the School of Education, and we want uh, the community to know uh, about their work, and that we give them an opportunity to interact with the community. And so that's what this, that's what this particular uh, event is about. This one's special, though. It's, it's, it's a little different. Uh, first of all, it's being co-sponsored by the Department of Psychology, so I want to thank them very much. It's being sponsored by them because our speaker this evening is one of the foremost cognitive psychologists in the world, and so we're really pleased uh, that they can co-sponsor with us. I'm not going to introduce the speaker. I'm going to turn that over to someone else, but let me just say that uh, in 2004, we did hire Paula Stanovich. Does that sound familiar? Paula Stanovich. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Paula is, is Keith's uh, uh, wife. And uh, that was a good deal for us because we got we got two for one. We had three things. So although Keith isn't paid by Portland State University, we totally claim him. <laughs> and uh, we're just so thrilled uh, with the award that he's won, uh, the Grammeyer Award. I, I don't I don't know how to describe it. Actually, it's probably the, the best way to describe it. Is it's kind of like the Pulitzer Prize in education. It is that prestigious. It is a very, very important award. And what an incredible honor for, uh, for Keith to, to receive that award. And uh, what an honor for us to be able to hear from him. But I'm not going to say more about it, because I'm going to turn this over to the chair of the special education department, Leslie Munson. Leslie's been chair for three years. She's done an outstanding job. Uh, Stepping down, that's anyway, I'm sorry to say that as chair, but I, so I wanted to give this give an opportunity for all of us to say thank you to her. Uh, and so give her a applause. Thank you. She'll stay with us though, she will be on the payroll, yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Leslie, who will formally introduce our speaker this evening. In 2008, 
He receives a Distinguished Researcher Award from the American Education Research Association Section on Special Education Research. It is an honor to prevent, present Dr. Sandwich to you this evening as the 2010 Graumeyer Award recipient in education. For his award, he was chosen from among 34 nominations worldwide. He won this prestigious award for his 2009 book, What Intelligent Tests Miss, The Psychology of Rational Thought. Tonight, this presentation will focus on some of the ideas in the book. In the book. Please welcome Keith, the Graumeyer Award winner and an ardent Vikings fan. <laughs> stated assumption that I wish to challenge. Instead, I wish to show that intelligence tests are radically incomplete as measures of cognitive functioning in addition to whatever they fail to assess in non-cognitive domains. My contention is that people tend to underestimate what is missing because they are confused about what IQ tests measure. When I say that people are confused about the intelligence concept and about what IQ tests measure, I mean scientists as well as lay people. We can illustrate this with the case of President George W. Bush. His statements and actions have convinced many people that he is a man of truly mediocre intelligence. Even his supporters who like his actions will not defend his intellect in light of famous examples of his speech and thought, such as. There are, of course, websites containing many examples of these, and they are all famous YouTube clips. Now, this first quote here illustrates something. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the intellectual qualities for which Bush is well known in this quote here. His overconfidence, his certitude, his reluctance to re-examine his beliefs. This last quote illustrates another distinguishing feature of President Bush, his lack of metacognitive awareness. Both opponents and supporters of President Bush agree that his thinking is defective in certain ways, and both assume that he would not score highly on conventional IQ tests. Now, I really want to emphasize here that this is not a partisan point. I am not talking about Bush's policies. 
I am talking about his style of thinking. And there is broad agreement, even among the supporters who served him in the White House, that the characteristics I will discuss are typical of his manner of thought. His manner of thought, as opposed to his policies, is not in dispute. In a generally positive portrait of the president, his speechwriter and longtime supporter David Frum nonetheless notes that he is impatient, quick to anger, sometimes glib, even dogmatic, often uncurious, and as a result, ill informed. <laughs> Conservative commentator George Will agrees when he states that in making Supreme Court appointments, the president has neither the inclination nor the ability to make sophisticated judgments about competing approaches to construing the Constitution. David Kay, one of the world's leading experts on weapons in inspections, gave a briefing to Bush and left the meeting almost shocked at Bush's lack of inquisitiveness. And then there is Bob Woodward's characterization that senior officials in Baghdad observed that faith not evidence was the basis for his decision making. In short, there is considerable agreement that President Bush's thinking has several problematic aspects that psychologists might label things like lack of intellectual engagement, cognitive inflexibility, high need for closure. These are, these are all uh, thinking dispositions that have been studied by psychologists. There are scales that measure them and a reasonable, a reasonable amount of empirical evidence on them. Given this level of agreement about Bush's intellectual deficits, it was a surprise to many when a study was reported which took various college placement exams and armed forces tests that older prominent people had taken in their youth and converted the college placement scores and armed forces battery scores from early life into an estimated IQ score. No one was surprised that the professorial Al Gore received a prorated IQ score of 125 to 135. Likewise, when Bush's 2004 opponent, John Kerry, had his youth test scores prorated to an IQ, it was no surprise when his estimate was 120 to 125. What did surprise people was that George Bush's prorated IQ score based on virtually the same tests, ended up being the same as Kerry's. Everyone, both opponents and supporters, got it wrong about Bush's intelligence, but for totally different reasons. Both opponents and supporters of Bush are confused about what intelligence tests measure, but they are confused in different ways. Bush's detractors describe him as taking disastrously irrational actions, and they seem to believe that the type of poor thinking that led to those disastrous actions would be picked up by the standard test of intelligence. Otherwise, they would not have been surprised when his scores were high rather than low. Thus, the Bush detractors must have assumed that a mental quality, rational thinking tendencies, could be detected by the tests that, in fact, the tests do not detect at all. Now, in contrast, Bush's supporters like his actions, but admit that he has street smarts or common sense rather than school smarts. The supporters assumed that the test measured only school smarts in the trivial pursuit sense of who wrote him. That the test would actually measure a quality that cast Bush in a favorable light was something even his supporters never anticipate. Both groups, supporters and opponents of Bush, are confused about what intelligence tests do and do not measure. Both have become confused by what I've termed the greatest historical anomaly in modern psychological science. As many of you know, in 2002, a psychologist, Danny Kahneman, won the Nobel Prize in Economics for work done with his longtime collaborator, Amos Tversky, who died in 1996. The press release for the award drew attention to the roots of the award-winning work in the analysis of human judgment and decision-making by cognitive psychologists. One reason that this work was so influential was that it spoke to deep issues concerning human rationality. 
As the Nobel announcement noted, Kahneman and Tversky discovered how judgment under uncertainty systematically departs from the kind of rationality postulated in traditional economic theory. Kahneman and Tversky, along with many other investigators, have shown how the basic architecture of human cognition makes us all prone to errors of judgment and decision-making. Additionally, it has been shown that there are systematic differences among individuals in the tendency to make errors of judgment and decision-making. My own research group has tried to find out what predicts these individual differences. That there are systematic individual differences in the judgment and decision-making situations studied by Kahneman and Tversky means that there are variations in important attributes of human cognition related to rationality. It is a curious fact that none of these critical attributes of human thinking are assessed on IQ tests or their proxies, such as the SAT. Most lay people are prone to think that IQ tests are tests of, to put it colloquially, good thinking. Scientists and lay people alike would tend to agree that good thinking encompasses good judgment and decision-making, the type of thinking that helps us achieve our goals. In fact, the type of good thinking that common diversity study was deemed so important that research on it was awarded the Nobel Prize. Yet assessments of such good thinking are nowhere to be found on IQ tests. It is a profound historical irony of the behavioral sciences that the Nobel Prize was awarded for studies of cognitive characteristics that are entirely missing from the most well-known mental assessment device in all of psychology, the intelligence test. Because of their vast influence, IQ tests have both explicitly and implicitly defined, for the layperson and psychologist alike, what cognitive attributes to value. This is the social context for my conclusion that intelligence tests are radically incomplete as measures of cognitive functioning. Now at this point in the talk, some of you may think, well, so what? Doesn't everyone know that IQ tests are useless and that they don't predict much? Didn't Howard Gardner and other critics of IQ tests already show that they are pretty useless? Doesn't everybody know this already? Well, my answer to this query is what everyone knows is wrong. IQ tests predict performance on an almost limitless number of cognitive tasks. This is a table from John Carroll's Compendium of Factor Analytic Studies. There are dozens of tables like this in Carroll's opus, all showing the innumerable cognitive tasks that correlate with intelligence. IQ tests predict not just cognitive tasks in the laboratory, they are the single best predictor of performance in many real world occupational settings. I refer here to the classic work of Schmidt and Hunter on occupational predictors, showing that intelligence predicts occupational performance better than any other measurable variable. This slide simply illustrates the substantial size of the correlation and the fact that they are not limited to the skill acquisition period, but include on-the-job performance as well. This slide shows the variety of different occupations in which a substantial correlation obtains. Moving from this issue of occupational prediction back to the domain of laboratory studies of cognition, it is in fact true that the correlation between IQ and any cognitive task is so ubiquitous that cognitive and developmental researchers routinely control for IQ when examining any new association involving a cognitive variable. And of course, what we are talking about here has been known for over 100 years. It is Spearman's positive manifold. And the only reason I bring it up in this context is that so many people think that Howard Gardner and Robert Sternberg and Dan Goleman and Stephen Gould and others have overturned Spurman's positive manifold or shown it to be mistaken in some way. To the contrary, positive manifold is acknowledged by all truly scientific commentators and researchers 
at the forefront of the conceptual development of the, of the intelligence construct. Here is a typical quote from the literature. I've given you this brief discussion of positive manifold because I want to firmly establish so that the findings from my own lab can be properly contextualized what is newsworthy in the domain of cognitive individual differences. To put it colloquially, it's news when things don't correlate with intelligence. Most critics of IQ tests assume there will be no further news in the cognitive domain. Hence the popularity of advocating for intelligences outside of the cognitive domain, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, bodily kinesthetic intelligence, etc. However, these standard critiques of intelligence tests contain the unstated assumption that I mentioned at the outset, that although intelligence tests miss certain key non-cognitive areas, they encompass most of what is important cognitive. In fact, intelligence, as conventionally measured, may be missing, criti uh, missing a critical cognitive domain, a domain of thinking itself. Thus, a major conclusion from our work has been that, from an individual differences perspective, there may be more news in the cognitive domain. The case of Bush and the Nobel Prize to Kahneman suggest as much. We do not have to move to the social and emotional domains to find things that IQ tests miss. This is suggested by the case of President Bush. Several years ago, I coined the term to refer to discrepancies between intelligence and rationality. What we see in George Bush, irrational thought and action despite more than adequate intelligence. The term is disrationality. The term is employed by analogy to learning disabilities, such as dyslexia and dyscalculia, which are defined by reference to aptitude achievement discrepancies, that is, discrepancies between intelligence and another ability domain. So the existence of dysrationalia itself suggests major cognitive domains are missing, are missed by IQ tests, as does my previous discussion of the odd historical contingency of our field assessments of good judgment and decision making, the type of thinking that helps us achieve our goals, and that Kahneman received the Nobel for studying are missing from IQ tests. What is missing are assessments of the tendency to think rationally. Now this is established in two separate ways, one theoretical and one empirical. The theoretical point is that rationality and intelligence are, conceptually, two different things. Now I need, to, <clears throat> I need to emphasize here, because much writing about intelligence is unconventional, that my conceptualization of rationality and intelligence assumes standard relations between concepts and operations, unlike some traditions in, writing, in, in, in writings on intelligence, I take a standard view of intelligence, confining the meaning of the term to the constructs actually measured by the tests, many of them with quite richly developed conceptual structures now. In contrast, so-called broad definitions of intelligence are promiscuous, in that they discuss a concept of intelligence that is not measured by the tests. For example, it took real chutzpah for David Wexler to define intelligence in his book as the aggregate or global capacity of the individual to act purposely, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with his environment, despite offering an IQ test with his name on it that measured no such thing. <laughs> Major broad theorists such as Sternberg and Gardner define a host of so-called intelligences like the ones listed here, while at the same time stressing the separability of these entities. In a sense, these theorists seek to break a rule of construct validity and of common sense. Things that are named the same should go together. If these things really are separate mental faculties and we wish to emphasize their separateness, then we should not suggest just the opposite 
by calling them all intelligences. My definition of intelligence is a more standard one. It is the accepted definition in cognitive neuroscience and in the journals of the field. It is the cognitive constructs that the tests actually measure, computational power, fluid intelligence, and acquired knowledge, crystallized intelligence. Unlike many in the intelligence field in this talk, I will use constructs and operationalizations in a standard manner, i.e. in the way you're taught in Psych 101. So why rationality and intelligence are not the same thing conceptually? To think rationally means adopting appropriate goals, taking the appropriate action given one's goals and beliefs, and holding beliefs that are commensurate with available evidence. Although IQ tests do assess the ability to focus on an immediate goal in the face of distraction, they do not assess at all whether a person has the tendency to develop goals that are rational in the first place. Likewise, IQ tests are good measures of how well a person can hold beliefs in short-term memory and manipulate those beliefs. But they do not assess at all whether a person has the tendency to form beliefs rationally when presented with evidence. And again, similarly, intelligence tests are good measures of how efficiently a person processes information that has been provided, but they do not at all assess whether a person is a critical assessor of information as it is gathered in a, in a natural environment. But perhaps the skills that are measured on IQ tests are related to those things, relate to rational thinking skills, even though such skills are not assessed directly on the test. And this is where empirical research comes a good amount of it from my own research lab. We have used the operationalizations of instrumental and epistemic rationality that are common in cognitive science. Instrumental rationality, maximizing goal fulfillment. Epistemic rationality, how well beliefs map to the world. And we've turned to a rich tradition in the so-called heuristics and biases literature of cognitive science, which in its many effects, tasks, and biases of cognition provides the empirical measures of the concept of rational thought. Listed here is a collection of tasks, effects, and biases that have been studied in our lab and on which there are substantial individual differences. Collectively, they represent a reasonably comprehensive sampling of how theorists would define instrumental and epistemic rationality. The surprising finding from over a decade's worth of work by our group is that aspects of rational thinking are so relatively independent of intelligence. Now I say surprising in light of the ubiquitousness of Spearman's positive manifold that I discussed earlier. It is surprising that such fundamental cognitive characteristics as those associated with rational thought are so little associated with intelligence when so many other fundamental cognitive tasks are so highly coordinated. Recall my earlier slide from John Carroll's work. Now to be specific, I should say that there are two groups of tasks. One group with literally no association with intelligence and another set that are correlated, but the correlations are surprisingly low in magnitude. Here is the surprisingly long list of tasks that show virtually no association with intelligence in university samples. Here is a set of tasks that do correlate with intelligence, but the correlations are rarely higher than 0.3, and often as low as 0.1. We have summarized even more relations than those displayed in a recent series of papers and books. These publications also summarize another important empirical data pattern that explains why rationality and intelligence dissociate. It is that thinking dispositions, things like need for cognition, actively open-minded thinking, and reflectivity, impulsivity, predict performance of rational thinking tasks after intelligence has been partialed out. This relationship has been shown in several labs in addition to our own. Here are some of the thinking dispositions that have been examined in these studies and have been found to be independent predictors of rational thought 
after IQ has been partial. An example of one such data pattern in an adult sample is shown in the following slide. Here we see that SAT, as a measure of cognitive ability, has roughly a 0.5 correlation with the criteria variable here, which is a composite measure of seven heuristics and biases tasks. However, we see that a composite thinking dispositions measure predicts additional variance after IQ has been partial. An example from a study of sixth graders and eighth graders is shown in the next slide. Here we see a variety of criterion variables, things like inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, and probabilistic reasoning. In each case, a thinking disposition measure predicts significant variance after cognitive ability has been partial in a regression. I have mentioned the many experimental effects from what is known as the heuristics and biases literature, the literature in cognitive science that operationally defines rational thinking, that are surprisingly dissociated from intelligence. And now I will just illustrate a few quick examples, although it's important to realize that the different paradigms studied in my lab and others number over 50. One effect that is remarkably dissociated from IQ in university samples is my side bias, a crucial aspect of critical thinking. My side bias results from the fact that people are cognitive misers. They are disposed to deal only with the most easily constructed cognitive model. And the easiest models to represent are egocentric ones. Thus, my side bias occurs when people evaluate evidence, generate evidence, and test hypotheses in a manner biased for themselves and their own opinions. Subjects in one condition of a study run with my colleague, Rich West, read the following. According to a comprehensive study by the US Department of Transportation, a particular German car is eight times more likely than a typical family car to kill occupants of another car in a crash. The US Department of Transportation is considering recommending a ban on the sale of this German car, and subjects were asked, do you think the United States should ban the sale of this car? Over 78% of the subjects said yes, it should be banned. A converging question, do you think that this car should be allowed on US streets just like other cars, got a converging over 73% to say yes, this car um, should not, uh, no, sorry, no, this car should not be allowed on American streets. The statistics on the dangerousness of the car in the example happen to be real statistics at the time of the study, but they are not the statistics for a German car. They are actually the statistics for the Ford Explorer, which happens to be a very dangerous vehicle indeed. Thus, a second group of subjects read a second scenario that simply reversed the facts. According to a comprehensive study by the US Department of Transportation, Ford Explorers are eight times more likely than a typical family car to kill occupants of another car in a crash. The Department of Transportation in Germany is considering recommending a ban on the sale of the Ford Explorer in Germany. When asked whether the Explorer should be prohibited or banned on German streets, only 45% of people see this as reasonable as, as opposed to the over 70% when the situation is reversed a clear my side bias. And the main point is that in this paradigm, and in many other paradigms in addition to this one that assess my side bias, all show the same thing. That my side bias of various types is virtually independent of intelligence in university samples. Another classic effect in the heuristics and biases literature is that many people suffer from overconfidence in their knowledge calibration. They think that they know more than they do. And they think they can process new information better and faster than others. Baruch Fischoff's classic paper kicked off the study of this cognitive bias. Psychologists have done numerous studies using so-called knowledge calibration paradigms, and I don't have time to discuss the technical studies here. But there are several less technical demonstrations in the literature, and many of them show how overconfidence 
has many practical implications. Consider a survey by the Canada Safety Council in which 75% of drivers admit to either talking on the phone, eating, shaving, or applying makeup while driving. Oddly, 75% of the same people said they were frustrated and appalled by other drivers they saw eating or talking on the phone. And similarly, thousands of people overconfidently think their driving is unfair while talking on their cell phones or texting, which we've seen a lot about recently, including Oprah's campaign. In a self-evaluation exercise conducted with 800,000 students taking the SAT, less than 2% rated themselves less than average in leadership. <laughs> Over 60% rated themselves in the top 10% in the ability to get along with others. Yet the correlation between avoiding overconfidence bias and intelligence is quite modest in university samples, leaving plenty of room for very intelligent people to be characterized by this irrational thinking style. The data is similar with respect to another cognitive style that impedes optimal responding, something called impulsively associative thinking. Here's a typical problem from Shane Frederick's test of his tendency. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now many people give the first response that comes to mind here, 10 cents. They show a characteristic that is common to many reasoning errors. They are what are termed cognitive misers. They give the first response that comes to mind, which is 10 cents. But if they thought a little harder, they would realize that this cannot be right. The bat would then have to cost $1.10 for a total of $1.20. IQ is no guarantee against this error. Frederick found that large numbers of highly select students at MIT and Princeton were cognitive misers. They said 10 cents rather than the correct answer, 5 cents. There are many other tests of impulsively associative thinking. Consider the following problem we've studied a lot. Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? The vast majority of people answer C, cannot be determined. When in fact, the correct answer is A, yes. If Anne is married, then the answer is yes. And if Anne is unmarried, then the answer is yes. The fact that the problem does not reveal whether Anne is married or not suggest to many the easy answer that nothing can be determined. Such shallow processing is characteristic of the cognitive miser looking for a quick, easy solution. But this and many problems like it are only mildly correlated with intelligence in the range of only 0.2 to 0.3. The cognitive miser is too easily affected by context. Which of these two do you think yields the higher estimate of the number of headaches. The first, of course, okay, because the context suggests that double-digit numbers are not abnormal. But such context effects are only slightly moderated by intelligence. Which rating yields the higher estimate of how dangerous the disease is? The first, actually, because despite the fact that the frequency is lower, the 1,286 comfortizes the victims in a way that the percentage does not. Again, a response trend little related to intelligence. Or consider this context effect studied by Dan and Ariely. The salient word free lead subjects to prefer the first alternative over the second, despite the fact that the second includes the first plus three more dollars, a suboptimal pattern not attenuated by high intelligence. Problems dealing with probabilistic knowledge show a similar modest correlation with intelligence. Here, for example, a problem tapping the tendency to display the gambler's fallacy. When playing slot machines, people win one, one out of 10 times. Lori, however, has just won on her first three plays, 
what are her chances of winning the next time she plays? People need to realize that streaks or runs don't change the probability as indicated in the correct answer, which is alternative C. I'll stop the examples here because there are over 40 of these relationships that we have examined. I'll refer you to the published papers for more demos and details. I would like to turn now to putting these findings in context by showing you what we are doing theoretically with them. Our research has shown that IQ tests miss, miss important processes in the cognitive domain. That the processes that are missed are measurable and that reliable variants in them can be related to thinking dispositions. This is because our concept of rational thinking is a more encompassing concept than intelligence. My lab has concentrated our recent theoretical efforts on accommodating these findings within the currently popular dual process framework. But we have been led by these individual difference findings and by the separability of rationality and intelligence to a tripartite model of mind. Evidence from cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology is converging on the conclusion that the functioning of the brain can be characterized by two different types of cognition having somewhat different functions and different strengths and weaknesses. The defining feature of type one processing is its autonomy and speed. Type two processing, in contrast, is relatively slow and computationally expensive. One of the most critical functions of type 2 processing is to override type 1 processing. That is sometimes necessary because type 1 processing is quick and dirty, yielding only a ballpark solution. Type 2 processing is responsible for the hypothetical reasoning and cognitive simulation operations that compute more optimal responses than those primed by type 1 processing. However, the research I have presented to you today has indicated that type 2 processing needs to be understood in terms of two levels of processing, what are here termed the algorithmic level and the reflective level. I have presented the tripartite proposal in the spirit of Dan Dennett's book, Kinds of Minds. I have labeled the traditional source of type 1 processing as the autonomous mind, but differentiated type 2 processing into the algorithmic mind and the reflective mind. The autonomous mind can be overridden by algorithmic level mechanisms, but override itself is initiated by higher level control. That is, the algorithmic level is conceptualized as subordinate to the higher level goal states and epistemic thinking dispositions of the reflective mind. This figure presents the theoretical conjecture in terms of the individual differences I've just been talking about. It has proposed that variation in fluid intelligence largely indexes individual differences in the efficiency of processing of the algorithmic mind. In contrast, thinking dispositions index individual differences in the reflective mind. This cognitive structure makes it more readily apparent why rationality, as defined in cognitive science, is a more encompassing construct than intelligence as measured by traditional IQ tests. Rationality encompasses both the reflective and the algorithmic mind, whereas IQ tests assess only the latter. This, then, is the model that provides the structure upon which we have built a taxonomy of rational thinking errors that people make. Before presenting you with that taxonomy, I must emphasize, though, one further important aspect of rational thinking. Each of the levels of the tripartite model of mind has to access knowledge to carry out its operations, as illustrated here. The reflective mind accesses general knowledge, opinions, beliefs, and the reflective, reflectively acquired goal structure. The algorithmic mind accesses production system rules for sequencing behaviors. And finally, the autonomous mind accesses information that has become tightly compiled due to overlearning and practice. The term mind layer was coined by Harvard cognitive scientist David Perkins to refer to the rules, knowledge, and procedures that a person can retrieve from memory in order to aid decision making and problem solving. Thus, using Perkins' term, we are looking here at the mind layer 
uniquely is accessed by each level of analysis. We now have all we need to illustrate a taxonomy of thinking errors that my lab has developed. Errors arise because humans are cognitive misers and because they have mind wear problems. Presented at the top of the figure are several characteristics of the cognitive miser. At the bottom are the various classifications of mind wear problems. Although covered in depth in my book, the details need not concern us here. Instead, I'd like to finish my discussion today by showing you how we are addressing a different question, which is, can we do anything with these results practically, in addition to what I have shown you theoretically? I would answer that we can do something of great practical import, that we now have a theoretical framework and enough operational measures to attempt the assessment of rational thinking, which could have profound implications for what cognitive skills are valued and indeed change our current valuation. Because in our society, what gets measured gets valued. The historical contingency that determined that we were able to measure intelligence long before rationality has substantially determined our tendency to overvalue the former. And yet, oddly enough, I have discovered that there is enormous resistance to the idea of giving full value to mental abilities other than intelligence. For instance, when I lecture on how I think society has overvalued mental traits like intelligence and undervalued other traits, such as rationality, someone in the audience will invariably respond with a variant of the rhetorical question, well, would you want someone with an IQ of 85 performing surgery? My answer to that question is that perhaps not, but that I also would not want someone with a rationality quotient of 93 serving on the judicial bench, <laughs> someone with an RQ of 76 investing my retirement funds, or someone with an RQ of 94 marketing the home I'm selling. Of course, currently we do not have a rationality quotient as we have an IQ which might explain, at least to some extent, why IQ has acquired such value in relation to other equally important cognitive skills. But what if we could actually devise tests of rationality? In fact, I wrote my book in part in order to provoke a discussion about whether we might attempt to assess rationality as systematically as we do IQ. Of course, there is no such thing as a Wexler or a Stanford rationality test. There is no RQ test, but the point is, that there could be, using the same criteria used to justify current IQ tests, psychometric criteria, such as reliability of measure and the ability to predict relevant behavior. If not for professional inertia and psychologist investment in the IQ concept, we could choose tomorrow to more formally assess rational thinking skills, focus more on teaching them, and redesign our environment so that irrational thinking is not so costly. I'm not saying that an RQ test could be constructed tomorrow. Such instruments are not constructed on the back of an envelope. It would, of course, take an ETS-like effort, costing millions of dollars. But the point is that practically, in terms of the cognitive technology now in place, it is doable. Only issues of demand and cost prevent it. Let me now show you that we have in hand practical tools to more appropriately value the true range of mental faculties that we have labeled, that are labeled cognitive. We could, in principle, develop a test of rational thinking. Running from the theoretical to the practical, here is how we would do it. In terms of concepts discussed in the tripartite model presented earlier, this figure shows what we propose as the conceptual structure of rational thought. The first partition in the figure indicates that rational thought can be partitioned into fluid and crystallized components. Fluid rationality encompasses the process part of rational thought, the thinking dispositions of the reflective mind that lead to rational thought in action. The left part of the figure illustrates that, unlike the case of fluid intelligence, fluid rationality 
is composed of a variety of cognitive styles and dispositions. Crystallized rationality on the right is likewise multifarious. Each of the processes on the left and the knowledge bases on the right are grounded in a paradigm that could serve as an assessment device. In the next series of slides, I will show you the grounding paradigms for the components of rational thought displayed in this figure. On the left side are some of the major dimensions of fluid rationality, and on the right are some of the measurement paradigms that have been used in the literature to operationalize those constructs. For example, good decision making is in part defined by, by decisions that are not unduly defective, uh, affected by irrelevant context. This, first major dimension in the table. Two paradigms that assess the latter tendency have generated enormous literatures. Resistance to framing has been measured with countless tasks in cognitive science, as has the resistance to irrelevant anchoring in decisions. This slide shows more of the operationalizing paradigms for fluid rationality, but also begins to show some of the paradigms for crystallized facilitators as well. These slides are just for illustration, so don't worry about the detail. As can be seen, there are a dense set of paradigms that have been used to assess crystallized facilitators of rational thought. To drive home the point that the concepts in our framework are actually empirically grounded, I have constructed another set of tables. This table provides for each measurement paradigm a pointer to the literature. That is, these tables point the reader to specific studies in the research literature that contain examples of tasks that could be adapted to serve as actual test items. And, 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 and an example taken from the paradigm is on the far right of the table. To see the construction of the table a little better, here we see a measurement paradigm on the left, a specific pointer to the literature on it in the middle, and an example item on the right. The tables are not for detailed reading in a lecture like this, but are simply meant to show you the basis for my contention that there is no conceptual barrier to creating a test of rational thinking. In virtually every case, laboratory tasks that have appeared in the published literature give us, as a minimum, a hint at what comprehensive assessment of the particular component would look like. These tables display in visual form what I mean by claiming that the measurement of rational thought is conceptually possible with the use of currently available instruments. However, if neither the fluid nor the crystallized components of rational thought cluster in the manner of a g-factor, then rational thought will be a difficult concept to practically assess in its entirety. But again, we should not shirk from measuring something just because it is logistically difficult, particularly if the domain is important. Economists and public policy experts measured the size of their country's GDP in the year 1935, despite, by present standards, primitive statistical tools and data gathering technology. The myriad components of the GDP then, wheat, corn, ingots, heavy machinery, etc., were each an important component of GDP in and of themselves, and it was not an argument against measuring them that they were hard to measure, that there were myriad components and that we did not know how all the components hung together statistically. In 1935, economists measured what they could with the tools they had, and they simply hoped that better knowledge via better tools lay in the future. We are at a similar juncture in the measurement of the concept of rational thought. As the extensiveness of the table show, this will be a monumental activity, an activity beyond the capabilities of a single laboratory such as my own. Hence, one of the purposes of my book was to recruit other researchers into this effort, and I am optimistic on this count. In the same month that the Graumeyer Education Award was announced, Scientific American recognized the importance of this work. Thus, there is every reason to believe that we will be successful in this important endeavor, which is essential, because only by measuring rational thought will we break the stranglehold that IQ tests have on our conception of mental life. There are important aspects of cognition missed by IQ tests, and I hope I have given you at least a hint of what they are in my talk today. Thank you.
taken efforts underway outside of your own research to develop such a sense of rationality? And if so, how long does it normally take for something like this to uh, be developed and then to be used as a standard tool of technology? Yes, the best current effort at an actual uh, scientific instrument has been done at Carnegie Mellon uh, by Wandi de Bruyne and Baruch Fischoff. Um, decision-making inventory, um, and they have a census standardized sample of adults. It would sample not the entire um, matrix of skills and knowledge bases that I've shown you here, but um, a, a reasonable selection of them that you can get in about two to three hours testing. And they have linked, um, they, they've shown, they're, they're one of the labs that have shown some of the data patterns that I alluded to you in the talk. They have shown that the performance on an instrument like that can predict two important things. One, it can predict uh, performance on laboratory tasks of rational thinking after the variance accounted for by measures of cognitive ability and intelligence has been partial. And then they have also uh, linked their measure as an independent predictor of uh, some real life outcomes. Okay, uh, And so um, they have an inventory of um, uh, real life um, measures. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, things like uh, foreclosure. Uh, credit, uh, credit card debt, um, parking tickets, that is the normal run-of-the-mill behavioral problems that people have as a criterion measure. And they've shown uh, that they're at least, I'll call it a miniature measure. I don't want to imply that they measured that huge thing I had up there. But their miniature measure has shown an ability to predict those types of outcomes after the variance due to cognitive ability has been we have, uh, with uh, Meg Toplak, who I mentioned at the outset at York University, um, we, we have done our two of our own attempts, less comprehensive than the Carnegie Mellon one that, that I mentioned. But we, uh, in conjunction with the uh, Addiction Research Foundation in Toronto, uh, we studied the sample of uh, problem gamblers, uh, actually three samples on the continuum. Uh, the most severe group was a group that lost on average $30,000 a year um, on gambling. And again, we've shown uh, that uh, some of the measures in a miniature inventory uh, can predict those types of problems after intelligence partial. And then Toplak also has looked at, uh, in a group of high school students, using the criterion measure of uh, um, of suspensions, high school suspensions, um, and, uh, and and shown the independent uh, you know, ability to predict an outcome measure like that. So um, the group at Carnegie Mellon is, is probably is, 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 has made the best attempt, and, and, and we've made our. Uh, as I said, if anyone wants to give me the twenty million dollars, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but on the basis of a modest Canadian short grant, that's that's what we. Uh, how are you going to take out the uh, the person's environment, you know, and just test rationality test the person's environment this person lives in? For example, maybe this individual, the culture the person lives in, uh, perhaps is not uh, not very educated, uh, uh, boring uh, jobs, or very uh, not very rich environment, no books or reading, maybe under high stress, versus a person with uh, a living in a rich environment uh, and uh, available with information, library, whatever. Uh, I, you've got two, essentially the same person, but they live in different environments. <coughs> How do you subtract out the environmental stresses or that may affect the person's uh, judgment or to make decisions? Uh, independent. 
Well, I mean, for the type of stuff I'm talking about here, we wouldn't want to subtract that out. I mean, uh, the, uh, I, mean I, would, I would certainly assume that they would be factors in uh, in some type of causal model of rational thinking, just as they are in intelligence. It's not a matter of, of I, 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 I would fully expect that you would find linkages like that. got a way to um, measure RQ, I'm, I'm wondering, um, would it be possible, would it be possible to teach rational thinking to schools? Is it possible, or should we do it? Absolutely, we should. Well, we teach irrational thought. <laughs>
staff for many years. I was teaching rational thinking. The importance of sample size, the consistency of probability, probability judgments, the resistance to base rate neglect. Okay? These are all these are all teachable. The only thing that gets them into a laboratory on rational thinking is the super concern we have for generalization of knowledge. Right? Do, doing, doing more than just recapitulating the central limit theorem on, on a stat test. Right, but passing Kahneman and Tversky's famous right hospital problem. On there are two hospitals. In Hospital A, 25 babies are born a week. In Hospital B, 400 babies are born a week. Which hospital has more weeks on which 60 percent or more of the babies are boys? Don't answer. It's not a question. Okay. I won't ask you to put up your hands. Okay, it's hospital one, it's hospital A. Okay, with, with you, you, the, the subject has to be able to see that the number of babies, okay, is the size of the sample, okay? And that a sampling distribution of the two hospitals is going to be much more spread out for the hospital that has only 25 births. Hence, any outlier statistic like 60 or more is going to be more common in, in hospital A. You see, and we know the very same student who in a stat course will answer the central limit theorem correctly because they've memorized it will miss the hospital problem because they haven't induced the principle that, that right, a larger sample will more closely track the population value. Okay, they can spit back the central limit theorem but they fail common to Versky's uh, famous problems. So the only difference between what you teach in a stat course and the types of things that these laboratories look at is the concern for that type of far transfer. Can, can you see, okay, two, right, two, two players, uh, player A is much better than player B in uh, 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 squash. And they can play, uh, and, and so player B uh, can choose a game to nine points or a game to 21 points. Which, which one should the poor player take? Okay, well they should take the nine point game. Okay, okay, the less, the less chance is involved, okay, the poor the outcome for the less able player. Okay, if you're, if you're, uh, uh, okay, so anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go into more of these. Yeah. It's much that I enjoy about your presentation. I, I do have a question for you. You haven't talked much about the brain. And uh, you know, one could make a good case, for example, of the exercises when you're young and taking the SAT and uh, so on and so forth. The brain is not fully developed. Research is uh, useful, but in this domain, it's it's a bit like um, it's a bit like the research in my other specialty area that I uh, worked on before this work on decision making, and that was the psychology of reading. Um, 
Um, and um, there's been plenty of work on uh, you know, the neuroscience of reading, you know, reading difficulty in the past 10 years. And, and uh, you know, a lot of that work uh, ends up on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, but you know, none of it has told us one thing we didn't know in 1990. Not one thing in the area of reading. It's been convergent, and it's been nicely convergent uh, to, to have uh, a convergence from neuroscience. Uh, but there's nothing new in that neuroscience of reading. And so uh, I can't give you any value added there other than the behavioral science.
intelligence um, uh, behavior is such that I trust my judgment or my my reasoning behind it. But in the rational thinking is considering what you just said about biases, I don't trust my reasoning or I don't trust my judgment because of the biases that I might have. And that would be more rational. That's rational right. Thinking. There's a yes. There's a very important. Um, Series of uh, studies and work that your question calls to mind, and it's by Emily Cronin at Princeton University. And she studied something uh, she calls the bias blind spot, and it's a it's a it's an aspect of uh, metacognition with respect to the cognitive biases. Okay, so 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 people are people are you know a bias is described to, to people. My side bias is described, and, and the, the person. You know, do you understand this bias? Yes, I do. Do you think uh, that um, you see it all the time in other people? Yes, I do. Uh, do, you, do you think it's characteristic of your own thinking? Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> okay, maybe. And, and it's the discrepancy between how much people have metacognitive awareness of the bias in themselves and how much they think the, the, you know, the bias is out there in other people. And of course, there's a huge discrepancy there. She calls that the bias blind spot. Now, I mentioned that one because that, that's one we have looked at in the lab. And that one was on the list that I showed you. And that, that was one it has it is absolutely unassociated with intelligence. It's one of the most extreme ones we've ever studied. Okay? It had, it, 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 it had you know, correlation zero. Where do you put divergent thinking, creative thinking? Yeah, I mean, creative um, types of thinking come come in through the back door of, of some of these concepts. It's not a it's not a, a, a kind of a one chunk block in the model. I mean, a lot of the reason, a lot of uh, you know, the recent work there uh, have has been showing a lot of dispositional effects. In or a motivational trait than it is a cognitive one. And so it would be picked up uh, by some of the early things. I don't, I don't want to go back because I see I'm on slide one point. I won't back up at this point. <laughs> point of no return. But uh, in, 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 if, if, if I could pick apart that earlier slide on fluid rationality, you would see some of the characteristics uh, that relate. For example, need for cognition is an important component our of rationality uh, and that that uh, you know would uh, relate to operational measures of creativity. So some of the micro components of, of what that research has shown would be represented uh, in our uh, in our taxonomy. Alternative hypotheses. Yeah, alternative hypotheses. And of course that was all through our our taxonomy. Yeah. Fleshing fleshing out a model like in the four part selection.
Yeah, look, let me give you an example of, of the types of things that cognitive psychologists have studied in this domain. And, 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 and so let's take the practical domain of personal uh, investing, okay? Every year or so, uh, Money Magazine um, does this issue, uh, and, and it shows all the mutual funds, and let's just deal with the stock funds, and it shows, you know, over some period, year, five year, 10 year period, you know, what the annualized return of the fund has been. So let's just imagine the fund, the Smith fund, and its annualized return over the past five years has been 5.7%. And then in, in an issue, they do a very interesting analysis. They, they look at the return of the investors in the fund. And they find that the return from the investors is often something like 1.9%. Now wait, so you, you might you might say to yourself, what you know, what does that mean? What do you mean? How can the how can the return of the fund be 5.7%, but the return of the investors in the fund be 1.9%? Well that 5.7 is calculated in a particular way, okay? That would be the return for an investor who held the fund at the beginning of the period and continued to hold it all the way to the end. That investor would have the annualized 5.7% that Money Magazine shows you, okay? But, of course, that's not what people do, okay? They come in and out of the They cash in and cash out. And they cash in and out at exactly the wrong time, <laughs> okay? And so what Money does is, is to show you for each fund what the gap is between the, the investor's return and the fund's return and, and it's always in the same direction. There's always, there's, there, there, the, the, the return to the investors is always much less. Why is that? Okay, we, well, we actually know a lot about why that is. There's a whole, there's many of the um, psychological characteristics I had up there relate to why the investor's return uh, is lower. Let me just mention, uh, okay, a couple. I mentioned the cognitive miser, right? Okay, and there's a lot of strategies of the cognitive miser make difficult cognitive tasks easy. And one thing, one thing the miser does is something called affect substitution, okay? All right, we substitute affect for hard thinking, okay? Imagine how we all felt back in 2007 with that, with that 14,000 Dow Jones average and those homes going up, and we all felt great. And uh, that was just the attitude that makes people want to buy stocks. And, and if you think of how we felt in March of 2009, when the Dow was six or seven thousand, we all felt, and the sky was falling, it, and we all felt horrible. It, it makes you want to sell. And then if you've done those two things, you've completed the sequence that you definitely don't want to do in the market. You've bought high and sold low. Okay. So FX substitution has been uh, uh, studied in the class and directly related to investor behavior. Number two, overconfidence. So I mentioned that in the context of Bush, okay? So um, uh, one, one thing that overconfidence makes people do is, is, is to uh, trade a lot. Because, um, you know those day traders, right? Those guys in their pajamas and their, in their basements. And I say guys, because most of them are guys, okay? Okay, and they're doing, they're doing all that trading, thinking that they, have, they in their pajamas in their basements no, no more than a thousand analysts analyzing the same stock, okay? And that overconfidence leads them to trade. And it's an old, old finding in behavioral finance, decades old, that, that trading lowers returns, okay? You, you, you have to be a lot, lot better if you trade a lot, and overconfidence makes those people think they're a lot better, uh, and they're not, okay? And then finally, using that day trader example, another thing, from this domain of probability, okay? Most of the, most of the short-term movements of a stock are just noise. They're just chance, okay? Yes, over periods of years, stocks move because of real factors like uh, productivity and dividends and things of that type. But on a short-term basis, a statistician would call most of those movements just noise. It's randomness, and if you know anything about randomness and probability, you know that randomness doesn't call for an explanation, okay? But of course, what these traders are trying to do is to find an explanation for every 
little flip, and that leads them to trade. And that, as I've said before, lowers the returns. So, so you see, and I could go on and on with this list, but many of the traits in this list, overconfidence, affect substitution, excessive explaining of chance due to lack of probabilistic knowledge, okay, have been have been linked to this domain. Uh, Okay. And again, I I don't want to. Uh, by the way, uh, one little final note, and uh, you can have your second part of your question. But I don't just want to indict the lay investor. But uh, much of this work has actually taken you know actual so-called experienced traders and shown the same problematic psychological traits. Well, when the assumption. No, I don't know. are dealing with teachers and students, and they're all still really, don't, nobody is healed yet, because they don't quite get what's really happening. And maybe we don't. Well, knowledge calibration, you know, is a huge issue here, and I just used the yeah. panel mouthful. But, uh, uh, you know, we have um, a lot of this meltdown is because of complexification, interacting with aggregation, interacting with globalization, okay? The Dow went down 200 points now today because of Greece. And the Iran. Greece, you know, now it was, it was primarily Greece. Mm -hmm. um, Portugal. Trader, yeah, yeah. Greece has an economy that is smaller than Los Angeles, okay? All right, when, when things get, there were only a handful of that understood the synthetic derivatives, okay? There was a, a, a massive failure to calibrate knowledge, what we know and don't know. Okay. Well, that's, that's the thing that's going on now in a whole different way. It's not totally Do we want to give over the world again to, to only just to an equation that only six people understand? Yeah. In, in prior to 1973, we didn't know how to price derivatives that we've been hearing all about. We've been hearing all about these derivatives, right? Prior to 1973, we didn't know how to price those things. Two fellows by the name of Black and Scholes figured out how to price derivatives in 1973, and they won the Nobel Prize for it. In, uh, in the 1990s, Black and Scholes went and formed their own hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. And you might, this might be ringing a bell for some of you because in, in 1998, Long-Term Capital Management blew up and almost brought us all down with it. Okay, and there's a whole book on it. it it's part of the, the smartest guys in the room. Well, they might have been smart in terms of that restricted intelligence definition, but they certainly didn't have the RQ that I've been talking about tonight. As everybody in this room probably remembers, there were, in fact, a number of people, not a huge number of people, but a number of people in government agencies and in, in the finance world who said, hey, this, this doesn't compute, right. and this is why it doesn't compute, and they were ignored. And I... Yeah, Brooks the Lord got shot down by Larry yeah. Summers. And I, I kind of have always thought, well, was it so, so? Are you saying that they weren't they weren't ignored by cynical people who just said, "Well, we, we know we we know who who uh, we support. We support the finance guys. We support the big money guys." But it was a genuine at the top of these companies, and Larry Summit. It was a genuine 
not understanding. It was a genuine lack of acceptance because their their mindset, their frame of reference couldn't was too limited to adapt to this new information. And it wasn't simply a cynical disregard, but Yeah, this and see your this domain of of finance is one that where there's a ton of superstitious and magical things. Because there's a tremendous amount of randomness laid on top of some systematic effects. Okay? And and, 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 and of course again if you remember that that stat course that I've been extolling, right? And then that, that old analysis of variance was designed to tear apart the systematic variance from the random variance, right? And so you learn to look at everything in life in terms of in terms of that distinction. This is a domain that has a tremendous amount of, of, of probabilistic and chance factors laid over on top. And, and that spawns, we know from the, the work that I've been showing you tonight, a lot of magical and superstitious thinking. Right? Each, and, and, and so you get those, you, you get those finance shows where they're extolling, you know, the, the, the mutual fund with the highest returns in the last three months. Give me a break, okay? That, right? It's it's randomness. It's going to regress to the mean. Regression to the mean. Uh, foundational uh, uh, statistical principle. Okay. Most of these, um, if, if if you have enough, what's the story of the typing monkeys? Okay. Right. If you get, what is it? hundred. If you get monkeys in the in the basement of the British Museum, and you let, you know, eventually one of them will type Shakespeare. Okay. And yes, well, of course, that mutual fund manager that's on the front page of a weekly magazine, he's a typing monkey most of the time. Okay, and, and not to understand that is a real mistake of rational thinking. Okay, and so that's a fundamental in, in, in investment principle, right? Right, aggregate, don't, you know, you know I can. I can uh, give some financial advice after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a real important one because then you, you have people believing in the typing monkeys, right? Everyone, yeah, everyone predicted, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's like after uh, after impeachment in 1974, you couldn't find anyone who voted for Nixon, and now now everyone predicted this crisis. Where were they? Okay. In the back. Um, just a good discussion of your research uh, in relation to the financial markets can be found in the Black Swan by Nassim Taleb or Taleb. I, 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 I'm sorry. sorry the, the uh, name, uh, a good discussion of what you're talking about and the financial oh, markets. Oh, the Black Swan. Exactly. Um, okay. It explains a lot of this, and it was written before the crash, so yeah. even more relevant after. Yes, very, very, very relevant because Nassim was talking about the principles, you see, not the, okay, the, the principles as opposed to um, claiming um, to predict um, um, you know, specific events, okay? That's a, um, um, that's a, uh, that's an important distinction, by the way, that, that uh, in, in philosophy of science, there's this distinction. Uh, I'm going to relate this to the, to the financial world in a second. And uh, there's a distinction in philosophy of science between what are called robust process explanations and actual sequence explanations. And so an actual uh, sequence explanation of from Rule War One might be, uh, and now I've, I've trapped myself because I don't remember the facts all that well. But but you know the Archduke was shot, right? And he was in a parade, and the assassin shot the Archduke. I and then, thrown out of the, no, there was an assassination in there somewhere, and then the Austrian. Okay, and so an actual sequence explanation of you know why did Rule War One happen would would involve the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand. That's right, Archduke. And, and, and would, would involve all that. 
a robust process explanation would talk about more larger broad scale variables like the instability of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its relationship okay, to Germany and Britain. Okay. And uh, a sure sign that, that and, and, and actual sequence explanations are very difficult. They, they are something that almost no one predicts in advance, because who was going to predict an assassination? But you might have predicted, you know, a general conflict from the more robust principles. Okay. And by the way, we, we are often in, involved with this in education too, right? That, that this is often a conflict because a parent comes in with one child. They want to know the actual sequence for that child. But often what we have to give them are more robust principles, like early reading problems are linked to phonological awareness. And that's a robust principle. Not, okay. And, actually, and, and the reason why we have a lot, we can predict a lot better from robust process than we can from actual sequence is that actual sequence is full of the randomness. And I did want to your question is full of the randomness I was referring to, okay? And so it's a sure sign that you might have passed in to, the, to, to the domain of pseudoscience when you see people claiming to know, okay, actual sequence for, you know, this is why a stock is doing this and that, okay? If they're right, in, in an explanation, that micro, it's more likely they're a type of one. <laughs> Relating rationality to ethical, ethical, ethical decision making, ethical decision making. Oh, that, you know, that's very interesting. And I personally don't have work of that type. But the developmental psychologist David Mosh at the University of Nebraska has studied uh, ethical decision making among adolescents. And uh, he, he has done some work on heuristics and biases. I, I can put you on to some of his work. But that, we haven't done that in our lab. Thanks, Thank you. you. Thank you all for being here.